right, first of all, uh, thank you, of course, uh, to everyone uh, that brought me here. Uh, my friends uh, Sharon Murphy and Eric Bennett, along with uh, Ray Hain, uh, Pamela Belcher, Pat Breen, uh, and others. This is a rare privilege. Um, I hope you know that it is a rare thing to be at a college or university where the humanities loom large and take pride of place. That is a rare thing. Uh, and so I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to uh, bring a little bit of my current research to this particular uh, uh, forum. And if Oprah calls afterwards, then I may have to leave early <laughs> and never come back to a university again. <laughs> but that perhaps is unlikely. And I should also warn you, and I don't know if this is a common thing at these events, but I should also warn you that halfway through my talk, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to talk to me about something that I've said. So you'll need to be poised for that. Okay, let's get uh, going. Cornelius Sinclair was 10 years old, and he was trapped. He was stuck in the belly of a small ship like this one, bobbling in the middle of the Delaware River, a mile south of Philadelphia. A man had grabbed Cornelius Sinclair from a spot near that city's market an hour ago, had shoved a black gag across his mouth, tossed him into a wagon, and hauled him here. It was dark below this water line, but Cornelius could see enough to know that he was not the only black child locked down here. Four pairs of eyes stared back at him, four other black boys. Two looked about his size. They were probably nine or 10 or maybe 11 years old. Another was taller, perhaps 14 or 15. The last of them was shorter and smaller than everyone else. He might have been as young as six. Yesterday, all five boys had been free. Today, they were slaves prisoners of a gang of child snatchers who planned to sell their lives and labor, most likely to plantation owners in the deep, deep south. If their abductors got away with this, Cornelius would spend the rest of his life as someone else's property somewhere very far away. He would never see his family again. Cornelius Sinclair disappeared in late August 1825, one of dozens of African-American children to vanish in similar circumstances from Philadelphia that year alone. In the early 19th century, this city, Philadelphia, was the hub of American slavery's blackest market. Its gridded streets and tangled alleys were hunting grounds for crews of professional kidnappers who made their livings turning free black kids like Cornelius into southern slaves. These crews did their work swiftly and shamelessly in brazen affront to the city of Philadelphia's reputation as a safe haven for people of color and as the headquarters of the American anti-slavery movement. In truth, Early 19th century Philadelphia was probably one of the most dangerous places to be black anywhere in the United States. This was a product of its location as the nearest free city to the slave south. Philadelphia was just 40 miles north of the Mason-Dixon line, the boundary that separated Pennsylvania from two slave states, Maryland and Delaware. As Pennsylvania and other northern states had slowly disentangled themselves from race slavery in the 50 years after American independence, that boundary between Pennsylvania and the slave states to its immediate south and southeast, that boundary, the Mason-Dixon line, had become ever more important. By 1825, the year that Cornelius disappeared and was kidnapped, by 1825, the Mason-Dixon line seemed to divide two worlds, separating North from South and free states from slave states. It was the closest thing to a modern international border 
anywhere in North America. The city of Philadelphia's proximity to that frontier line made its many black residents, whether they were runaways from slavery or whether they were legally free, made its many black residents attractive targets for professional people snatchers. They preyed on members of this city's black community relentlessly, putting bullseyes on their backs and prices on their head. The people they stole away from the city streets could fetch anywhere up to $15,000 in today's money in Louisiana, in Mississippi, in Alabama, three of the new territories and states rising up along the Gulf Coast. The American settlers swarming into that region along the Gulf Coast, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, the American settlers swarming into that region needed and demanded a bottomless supply of forced labor to cut sugarcane and to pick cotton. They would take almost anyone to do that work, including children as young as 10-year-old Cornelius Sinclair. Planters in this region, the Deep South, may not have liked buying some of their slaves from kidnappers, but they had few other options. They had been forced to look to sources within the United States for their labor needs ever since 1808, which was the year that lawmakers in Washington had passed legislation outlawing any further slave imports from Africa or the Caribbean. That 1808 decision was a major turning point in the history of slavery in America because it spurred the growth of a large and dynamic internal domestic slave trade within the United States. After the 1808 decision, interstate slave traders as opposed to international slave traders, after 1808, interstate slave traders here in the United States tried to satisfy the southwestern settlers' demands for black labor by bringing them thousands of American-born slaves each year from states like Maryland and Virginia. But settlers across the Deep South, again, Deep South, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, settlers across the Deep South wanted still more. And the more they were willing to pay, the more tempting and profitable it became for anyone sufficiently cold-blooded to try to kidnap free children like Cornelius from northern cities like Philadelphia, smuggle those children into the legal interstate supply chain, and sell them in this new, vast southwestern market. These incentives left Philadelphia's large and dynamic black community dangerously exposed to the predations of kidnappers. By 1825, the city of Philadelphia had become the center of an interregional kidnapping operation. It had become the northern terminus of something that we might usefully call the reverse underground railroad. This reverse underground railroad and its much better known namesake, the Underground Railroad, ran in opposite directions. But in many ways, they were mirror images of one another. On the Underground Railroad, enslaved people abandoned southern plantations and trekked northward, dreaming of new lives and new opportunities in freedom. On the reverse Underground Railroad, Free people vanished from northern cities like Philadelphia and were made to trudge southward to be sold into plantation slavery. On the Underground Railroad, conductors like Harriet Tubman risked their lives and their own liberty to help black fugitives make these epic journeys. On the reverse Underground Railroad, the conductors were kidnappers, and human traffickers motivated solely by money. The traffic on these two railroads was roughly the same size. 
Each one carried hundreds of black adults and children across state lines each year. Both of these networks roared to life in the early 19th century to exploit what had by then become major differences in the legal status of slavery in the North and the South. Both were loosely organized and highly opportunistic. Both ran on secrecy and relied on small circles of trusted participants, forged documents, false identities, and disguise. Whether traveling from the slave states into the free states, or vice versa, from the free states into the slave states, black voyagers along, the, black voyagers along this network had to hide in stables, barns, cellars, and attics. The direction of travel was, of course, different, but the routes taken by freedom seekers and by victims of kidnapping like Cornelius Sinclair, the routes were actually the same. They might even have passed one another on the roads from time to time. I'm going to guess that most of you probably know a good deal about the Underground Railroad. Historians have after all, spent decades studying the strategies and the tactics that Harriet Tubman and her fellow conductors and station agents used to help freedom seekers escape from slavery. Accounts by former passengers and biographies of former participants have spurred immense interest in the, in the Underground Railroad. Immense interest not only in Tubman herself, but also in her many comrades and collaborators. Their achievements, the achievements of the conductors and station agents on the Underground Railroad saturate our popular culture. There are walking tours. There are television shows. There are museums dedicated to celebrating the men and women who, in the words of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, quote, created the secret network through which enslaved people could escape to freedom. We know far less about the reverse Underground Railroad. Its conductors, its station agents, worked tirelessly to remain untouchable, and the identities of all but a handful of them still remain a secret more than 100 years later. Unlike Harriet Tubman, the conductors and station agents on the reverse Underground Railroad, the kidnappers, they never gave public lectures about their work. They never went on fundraising tours. Only rarely do their names appear in surviving police files or in trial transcripts. Their low profile, the result of the years they spent in the shadows, protected by bribes, avarice, and indifference. Unlike legal interstate slave traders who sometimes uh, bequeathed their business records and personal papers to southern colleges or southern historical societies, unlike legal slave traders, these outlaws who built the reverse Underground Railroad left no business records, no bundles of private papers for historians like Sharon and Pat and I to read or to examine. Kidnappers did not write memoirs. They did not pose for paintings or for photographs. Their homes and their warehouses no longer stand. But as I argue in a new book, a book scheduled for publication about a year from now in 2019, these professional kidnappers left their mark everywhere. They stole away tens of thousands of free black people in the first 60 years of the 19th century. Many of them children like Cornelius who were under the age of 16 years old. Most of those kidnapped could not read, could not write, and were never heard from again. Their families and friends, of course, searched, advertised, and petitioned. They waited in earnest for news, but usually no news came. 
Free black people in northern cities like Philadelphia had few white allies beyond the meager ranks of a handful of Quaker-led anti-slavery societies. What's more, white employers openly discriminated against African-American job applicants in places like Philadelphia, while city constables generally ignored people of color's complaints and turned a blind eye to most white-on-black street violence. So when children like Cornelius went missing, their parents could hardly ever persuade mayors or magistrates to get involved, to lift a finger. It was rarer still for anyone to be able to gather enough evidence to issue arrest warrants, search property, and interrogate suspects. And even then, experienced members of kidnapping crews knew what to do and knew what to say to talk their way out of trouble and get back to work. Solomon Northup was one of the few legally free people to experience the reverse Underground Railroad, then escape from Southern slavery, return home, and write about it all. And in 12 Years a Slave, his memoir published in 1853, Northup explains what happened to him. He explains how a pair of well-dressed white con men lured him, and Northup, you may know, was well-educated, he was prosperous, he was a musician, he was in his mid-thirties. He explains how he was lured uh, into New York City from his home upstate in 1841 by a pair of well-dressed white con men. In Manhattan, these con men wined him, dined him, and then drugged him, then sold him to an interstate slave trader in Washington, D.C. Northup was forced into a slave ship there, which was bound for New Orleans, and there, in the Crescent City, he was sold in one of that city's infamous slave marts to a planter who then put him to work in his cane fields. In 2013, an Oscar-winning film, here you see Chiwetel Ejiofor, in 2013, an Oscar-winning film based on Northup's extraordinarily powerful autobiography drew overdue attention to his ordeal. But both his original memoir and the Oscar-winning movie offer distorted and perhaps misleading views of who the actors on the reverse Underground Railroad were, who they usually targeted, and how they made their money. Northup's experience was not at all typical. Most kidnappings were not committed by smartly dressed confidence men but by poorer people who had never set foot in a fancy restaurant or bar. Most of the kidnappers active on the reverse Underground Railroad were men, yes, but some were women. Most of the kidnappers were white, but a surprising number of the kidnappers on the reverse Underground Railroad were black. They rarely approached highly literate, middle-aged men like Northup. They preferred instead to lure away poorly educated children with ruses or scams that could swiftly separate those children from their families, from the people that could stop it or who could help them. Very few of their captives ever traveled by ship to New Orleans either. Instead, kidnappers forced most boys and girls to trek southward on foot. Think about that, to trek southward on foot from somewhere like Philadelphia to somewhere like Natchez, Mississippi. I counted, it's two million steps. So kidnappers force most boys and girls to trek southward on foot, usually in small, specialized, overland convoys known as coffles. I think you saw a coffle earlier on in the slideshow. Coffle, by the way, uh, is from the Arabic word for caravan. These kidnappers' prisoners rarely ended up in showrooms or up on the auction block. They were vastly more likely to be sold off in cane fields at the side of the road, something like that, sold off in ones and twos to hard-up planters in Mississippi or in Alabama 
who could not afford the prices charged by fancy pants sellers in New Orleans. What I've just described is almost exactly what happened to Cornelius Sinclair, one of the five central figures, one of the five boys at the heart of the book I'm working on. In August 1825, Cornelius and four other boys living in Philadelphia fell into the hands of one of 19th century America's most fearsome gang of kidnappers. Their captors, Cornelius's captors, hustled them into that ship I mentioned just outside the city. Cornelius's kidnappers warehoused him and the other four boys for a while in a pair of safe houses in Delmarva, which is the name for the massive peninsula just south of Pennsylvania that's home to most of Delaware uh, and to slivers of Maryland and Virginia. You can see on this map um, the kidnapping begins in Philadelphia and a ship takes them, this dotted line, dotted line, dotted line, dotted line, dotted line, uh, to safe houses uh, here where they are warehoused um, for a period of time. Then those boys, those five boys, are marched halfway across the continent to the deep south where their captors try to sell them all as slaves. Now, I'm not actually going to say much more today about those experiences, what it was like after they got in the boat, in the ship um, just outside uh, Philadelphia. Despite the title of my talk, which has the word redemption in it, that's about the only clue I'm going to give you to what happens next. I'm really not going to give away the book's uh, ending. All I will say here is that what happened next to Cornelius Sinclair and to the other four boys in the belly of that ship bobbing in the Delaware River just outside Philadelphia, what happened next would involve two murders, three exhumations, an escape, a recapture, a lawsuit, the nation's largest manhunt so far, a suicide, a race riot, and a seance to conjure the spirits of the dead. The gang that stole Cornelius have been around for a while. This is a gang led by two white men. Their names are Jesse Cannon and Joseph Johnson. And it was their habit, as I've just said, to warehouse most of the children their agents captured from Philadelphia, to warehouse most of the children they captured in the attics of their houses, which were out again near the border of the Maryland-Delaware line on, uh, in a remote and underpopulated corner of the Delmarva uh, peninsula. And the gang's habit was to keep these kids captive in the attics of their houses for weeks at a time, usually for however long it took the gang to organize the children's onward journey across the country and into the deep south where they could be sold as slaves. There are lots of unanswered questions about the reverse Underground Railroad in general, and plenty in particular about how gangs like the Cannon Johnson gang used private homes as prisons to get the job done. How they used these private homes um, as uh, prisons to get the job done, how they used their private homes to try to uh, prevent those kids from escaping for weeks at a time, uh, why neighbors around these private homes uh, seemed to fail time and again to ever sound the alarm on the kidnappers who live next door, and why law enforcement in this region or in Philadelphia never successfully raided these safe houses on the Delaware-Maryland line. These are some of the questions people have. One of the small breakthroughs that I had in the course of my research for this book was a day back in 2013, when I came across a letter, a letter written to the officers of an anti-slavery group called the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. And the letter was written by one of their chief investigators, by the private detective they kept on their staff. It dates from 1819. And I think this letter sheds some light on some of the questions I just laid out about how these private prisons, safe houses on the Eastern Shore, 
work. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you, using a mixture of direct quotation from, my from the letter and also putting lots of stuff in my own words too, I'm going to tell you what that letter from the private investigator in 1819 said. And then when I'm done, and here's the bit you're going to hate, then when I'm done, I'm going to ask you what it reveals about how this particular gang of kidnappers and human traffickers operated, and fundamentally, how this gang got away with it all for as long as they did. So listen carefully, and then we'll talk afterwards. In May of 1819, 1819, of course, is six years before Cornelius and the four other boys vanish from Philadelphia streets. In May of 1819, Sarah Hagerman, a free black girl aged 11 years old, disappears from her job near the waterworks on the outskirts of Philadelphia. After her widowed mother makes a public appeal for information, a tip-off leads to the arrest of Sarah's employer, a woman named Margaret Ward. At Ward's trial that October, Margaret confesses to selling Sarah Hagerman to a stolen goods dealer, who in turn then sold this girl on to Jesse Cannon out on Maryland's eastern shore. Two weeks later, in early November 1819, the Pennsylvania Abolition Society dispatches its private investigator, a man named John Willits, out to the peninsula, out to the Maryland side of the Delaware line to try to rescue Sarah Hageman. John Willits was a dogged and experienced private detective. And he arrived in Denton, Maryland on November the 13th. With him was a man from Philadelphia named Miller who knew young Sarah Hageman and who hoped to be able to identify this child by the scar that she had on her forehead and another scar she had on one of her knees. But the pair of them ran into trouble almost immediately. The sheriff in Denton, Maryland, who volunteered his disgust for this traffic in kidnapped children, informed them that the man they were looking for, Jesse Cannon, actually lived beyond the sheriff's jurisdiction, just across the state line in Sussex County, Delaware. It took Detective Willits another full day to track down a Delaware judge willing to issue a warrant to search Jesse Cannon's house, and a second day to persuade a Delaware constable to actually execute that search warrant. The officer in question, a constable named Robeson, was none too keen to do so. He had heard that Joseph Johnson, who was Jesse Cannon's partner, and also Jesse Cannon's son-in-law, he had heard that Joseph Johnson was holed up in the same house as Jesse, and that both of these men were likely to be armed and dangerous. The private eye, the family friend, the reluctant local constable, they arrived together at Jesse Cannon's house on horseback on November the 15th as the day is turning to dusk. Peering through its back door, Detective Willits sees three or four small black girls inside though none seemed to match Sarah's description. Miller, a few paces behind him, thought he caught a glimpse of Sarah disappearing through the house's back garden and into the woods with some men. But before Miller could follow her, Joseph Johnson suddenly darted from behind a corner of the house and presenting a pistol to Miller's head, swore that if he attempted to advance another step, he would blow his brains out. Just, excuse, I'll start again. Joseph Johnson, the guy with the pistol, Joseph Johnson demanded to know their business. Without dropping his weapon, he peered at the search warrant that Detective Willits had in his hand, declaring that search warrant to be void because the sun had set and it was no longer day, and swearing to shoot the first man who should attempt to raise any latch on any door anywhere in this house. Only at the private eye's prodding did Constable Robeson insist that this warrant was still good, that it was still valid, even though dusk had come. 
But Joseph Johnson still gave no more than an, really an inch of ground. Joseph Johnson now allowed Constable Robeson and Mr. Miller to search the place for Sarah Hagerman, but only on condition that no questions should be asked of any other black people they might discover inside. While Detective Willits remained at the door, Constable Robeson and Mr. Miller ventured upstairs with Joseph Johnson and his father-in-law, Jesse Cannon, attending them with cocked pistols in their hands. You're trying to search a house, and there's two men pointing guns at your head as you do it. When Joseph Johnson reluctantly unbolted the door, leading to the second floor attic, Constable Robeson and Mr. Miller went in and came face to face with five black women bound tightly together with heavy chains. The five of them sat in terrified silence around a cold fireplace. Jesse Cannon's pistol pressed to his head. Mr. Miller hastily inspected each of them, looking for Sarah Hagerman's telltale scars. As he passed among them, each person's face became faintly illumined by a transient hope that she would be claimed, only to immediately relapse again into the settled features of despair as she saw him pass on without the ability to save her. None of these five women was Sarah Hagerman. They were all too old, all of them teenagers by Mr. Miller's reckoning. He and the others continued their house search for a few more minutes, but Sarah Hagerman was nowhere to be found. Joseph Johnson and Jesse Cannon seemed to be enjoying watching this rescue mission fail in front of their eyes, and they snidely insisted that their visitors go ahead and examine the outbuildings around this property as well. The visitors did so. Inside one shack in the yard, Detective Willits found two black boys and three more black girls. None of them bore Sarah's marks. By then it was obvious that they were not going to find her. Sarah's captors had evidently heard that this posse was coming and had hustled her off the property before they arrived waving around their search warrant for her. Night was now falling fast and with no hope of finding the girl now remaining, Detective Willits, Constable Robeson and Mr. Miller soon had to give up and go home. In lantern light, they retreated to their horses as Joseph Johnson and Jesse Cannon jeered at them and hollered at them as they left. The next morning, Willits and Miller returned to Philadelphia empty-handed. No one in Sarah Hagerman's family ever heard from her again. Now, as a reminder, we know all this because of the report that the private eye, Detective Willits, submitted two weeks later to his bosses at the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. That's the source I've been quoting here uh, these past few minutes. And as you've heard, it's pretty sobering stuff. And I think it's also quite revealing. But what does it reveal? That's what I want you uh, to tell me. So can you tell me anything you noticed, anything you heard about the attempted rescue of Sarah Hagerman, something that might explain how her kidnappers, which to, which to remind you is the same group of people who would kidnap Cornelius six years later, how her kidnappers were able to operate so successfully and so long. What did you hear that has any interpretive power, any analytical weight that sheds light on the larger problems of understanding how a gang of kidnappers breaking the law get away with it for so long? Tell me something you heard that might be useful. I'm going to ignore faculty and look for students. I can tell who you are by how old you are. <laughs> Reluctance of police to uh, sort of track down these kidnappers that, I, I mean, they sort of knew what was going on, but they were afraid to uh, bring them to justice. So we have the example of a judge in Delaware and a constable in Delaware uh, being at least slow and arguably reluctant uh, to get involved uh, with a gang of kidnappers they know to be armed and dangerous. So law enforcement in this local area out on the peninsula uh, does not seem proactive or brave. Thank you. Someone else? Yeah, you can yell it out or Sharon can run to you as fast as she can. <laughs> 
Along with that, oh, that's loud. Uh, along with that, uh, they seem to be big on technicalities. Like Johnson didn't want the, uh, didn't think that the warrant worked because it was past it was past day. So a lot of things like that. Yeah. So to make uh, something out of nothing, you might say that that little detail, him questioning the warrant, seems to suggest that he's had lots of run-ins with the law before, and he knows when he can try to push his luck. Uh, he's going to try to make sure the law, law can't touch him using what we might call loopholes or, or aggressive uh, countermeasures. Uh, thank you very much. Other ideas? Down here? Yeah, I mean, even with those technicalities out of the way, he didn't seem to be afraid to intimidate them with firearms and you know his presence. So he kind of knew that they were trapped you know, either way. So who was the they in that sentence? Intimidate uh, them? Who was, in, who was uh, the them? So Johnson, I guess, the, yep. with the pistol, yeah. Mm -hmm. He wasn't he afraid to intimidate, to intimidate the to law intimidate? enforcement, yeah. Who's he trying to intimidate? The law enforcement. Okay, good. So I said that law enforcement um, were fearful about these po folks who were armed, and then when they actually get in the same room, yes, these folks are armed. They're waving guns about, putting it to people's heads, and uh, law enforcement definitely feel their sphere of action shrink, their bravery tested uh, by that sort of direct confrontation with the threat of violence. Absolutely. Anyone else? The, the incredible lack of concern for all the other individuals that they found there in the house and the, in the properties. Uh, whose lack of concern for the other individuals? The private investigator and the constable. So to put that a bit more charitably than perhaps you did, uh, the, uh, the constable, the private investigator, and so on, have a warrant to look for Sarah Hageman. They don't have a warrant to look for person X, person Y, person Z, and that is to the... Uh, um, that's, that's the great tragedy of this, right? The, the, the legal system uh, needs them. They can, only, they can only extricate one person, the person named in the warrant. If that person is not there, the other people stay. And you could bet that if Willits and his friends come back with a warrant for person X a week later, person X will be, in, will be hiding in the woods, will be made to hide in the woods, or will have been sold on by then, right? Uh, anyone else? I saw one more hand back there. Well, I was going to make similar comment as Adrian. Uh, there seems to have been no legal framework for uh, seeking out or punishing kidnappers if the victims were black. And that may have been, had something to do with the fact that, that uh, slaves were routinely uh, placed in essentially supervision or, or chained together mm -hmm. so that distinguishing between those who had been kidnapped and brought down and other slaves uh, may not have been easy. Yes, to put, uh, to put words in your mouth or to rather mischaracterize what you said, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why the judge and the constable don't seem super enthusiastic uh, is not just because they're terrified of these people, um, but uh, because um, free black people kidnapped into slavery don't have many friends uh, in this part of the United States on the eastern shore of Maryland in Delaware. These places are slave states which are trying to sell off um, uh, enslaved uh, people. Free black people don't have many allies in places like Denton, Maryland or across um, the state line. Uh, there is no appetite to uh, defend the liberties uh, of black people enslaved or, un or, or, or free uh, at this time, which is related de definitely to what you said. Thank you for those. So uh, here's my own quick written summary uh, of some of this letter's uh, takeaways. As you've noticed, rather than record a daring and triumphant rescue, this letter instead offers rare first-hand testimony as to the limits of law enforcement's powers. It also shines light upon the size of Jesse Cannon and Joseph Johnson's operations. How many people were there, right? Sheds light on the size uh, and efficacy uh, of the operations and upon the effectiveness of the tactics these kidnappers use to protect their black market business and preserve their own liberty. Despite his years of experience as a private investigator, Willits struggles mightily to even gain the element of surprise. This is one thing we haven't touched on so far in the Q&A. They seem to know he was coming, right? 
uh, he can't gain the element of surprise. Willits, the private investigator, also struggled to, to secure a search warrant and to persuade county constables to enforce that warrant. Evidently well-connected and much feared locally, this kidnapping gang's leaders, Jesse Cannon and Joseph Johnson, bested this detective easily. Discovering Willits's report was a godsend for me. It doesn't feature Cornelius Sinclair, and it took place in 1819, but it nonetheless provides a way to illuminate a shadowy part of the experience that Cornelius and the other four boys would have gone through when they arrived in the same houses as captives six years later in 1825. And I mention this because I want you to understand why historians have so far written so very little about the reverse Underground Railroad. The problem is, of course, a problem of sources. For instance, the oldest of the five boys I write about in the book, a boy named Sam, he was only 15 when he vanished. The rest of the, four, of the other boys, like Cornelius, were much younger. They were aged between six and 10. One of them was homeless when he was kidnapped, while the other four came from families in different degrees of destitution. Most of them could not read or write. They were not the sort of people to leave behind traces in libraries and in archives. This is a problem, of course, because historians need sources. We need lots of sources to reconstruct past lives in ways that are fair and true. The stories and struggles of the many people who did not leave rich troves of papers, of diaries, or memoirs, their stories often remain untold and unstudied because of the source problem. To reconstruct the basic outline of Cornelius's journey along the reverse Underground Railroad, I've wrung what I can from a small packet of letters written to or from the mayor of Philadelphia, and from coverage of Cornelius's disappearance that appeared in a single anti-slavery newspaper, The African Observer, a deeply unpopular newspaper. Historians have long known about those two sets of sources, the letters to the mayor and some coverage in The African Observer. They've long known about those modest sources for some time. But those two bodies of sources turn out to be far too few and too thin to sustain a whole book about Cornelius and the four boys and what happened to them. So I've had to go looking elsewhere, digging around in pretty much any archive I can find for scraps of information, scraps that when put together can help flesh all this out. There has been, let me tell you, a lot of failure on my part, and a lot of wasted effort on my part um, along the way. A lot of days spent finding absolutely nothing at all. But ultimately, I think it's been worth it. Over six years of research, I have unearthed several little treasures buried within 35 archives in 14 states in the District of Columbia. Among them, this is my favorite, among them, a plaintive missing persons notice written by Cornelius's grieving father. I'll just let you read it. I'm not going to read it out, but you can read it. So among them, this sad, pointed missing persons notice written by Cornelius's grieving father. But also, I found the handwritten notes of a trial that took place in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, a trial that decided Cornelius' fate as a slave or a free person. And I found a pair of letters in which one of his kidnappers begs the governor of Pennsylvania that he is innocent. Let me wrap up with a couple of reflections about why I think learning about the reverse Underground Railroad is important, and why Cornelius Sinclair's particular experience as a rider 
on that railroad, an involuntary rider, I should say, why his experience is worth our time. To begin with, I would argue forcefully that families belong together. And thus, any story about free children ripped from their families and swallowed up by slavery is worth telling for its own sake. But the remarkable ordeal that Cornelius and his four fellow captives endured also demands attention for many other reasons. For one thing, it serves as a pointed reminder that child snatching was frequent, pernicious, and politically significant, and that black freedom in northern towns and cities was achingly fragile in the first half of the 19th century. This story demonstrates, too, the important role that this grotesque trade in kidnapped free people played in spreading American slavery into the Deep South over the same period. Now, as I said, I'm not going to reveal the uh, book's ending, and I'm not going to tell you exactly what happened to Cornelius after he was kidnapped and trafficked into Alabama. But I will say here that the dogged efforts of all those involved in trying to save him and trying to save the four other boys from the horrors of slavery in the Southwest, that their efforts would also have profound consequences. The rescue efforts of parents and allies in the, excuse me, the rescue efforts of parents and allies and the aftermath of that campaign would radicalize black, communi black communities across the free states, would embolden African Americans to embrace violence in the cause of self-defense and mutual protection as never before. Their efforts would reshape the rest of the American anti-slavery movement as well by encouraging white abolitionists, whoops, I'm clearly on the wrong slide. Let me go back one. I apologize about that. Um, their efforts uh, would reshape the rest of the American anti-slavery movement as well by encouraging white abolitionists, many of whom were writers, to focus the northern public's attention on the suffering of black families forcibly separated by slavery. But most immediately, outrage over the abduction of these five boys forced lawmakers in Pennsylvania, their home state, to pass tough new anti-kidnapping measures. Those laws, those anti-kidnapping laws known as personal liberty laws, those new anti-kidnapping laws enraged southern slaveholders and set in motion a chain of retaliations that culminated in the passage through Congress of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, a pro-slavery abomination that put this country on a collision course with civil war. Cornelius Sinclair's experience as a rider on the reverse Underground Railroad was the result then of the confluence of massive economic and political forces. And what happened to him would, as I've just argued, usher in a new chapter in the history of slavery and abolition in the United States. But the lasting legacy that I've just described must not be allowed to obscure the urgent and elemental stakes of his particular story. A 10-year-old boy and four other free black children were dragged into slavery in 1825. They would have to fight like hell to try to escape. Thanks very much. I am happy to take in the time Sharon says we have available. Uh, any comments or questions? Then let's start with, uh, if we could start with students, as always. You, you, you make me run. <laughs> well, they're telling me you have to talk to the microphone. Hi, I'm Sean. I'm a sophomore. Uh, I just had a question. So what, where did you start with this story? Like, I know you talked a little bit about how it was mentioned in the mayor's papers and things like that, but like, what got you going on Cornelius' story specifically? So apologize for the few people who had lunch with me who I told the story to. Uh, 
already, but for this larger group, let me say, uh, you heard in Sharon's introduction that I used to work on suicide. I wrote a book about suicide, and as I was finishing that book, well, when you write a book about suicide and you work on it for a long time, people who know you're writing about suicide uh, in early America will send you early American suicides they find all the damn time, right? Uh, they'll send you nuggets about your topic when it comes across their computer. So one day I got an email from a friend saying, hey, do you know about Patty Cannon's suicide? And I said, who is Patty Cannon? And it turns out uh, that Patty Cannon's mother in, uh, is the wife of Jesse Cannon, one of the kidnappers I mentioned uh, today, and the mother-in-law of Joseph Johnson, the other kidnapper I mentioned today. And in May 1829, she is found dead in her cell in the jail in Georgetown, Delaware. She is in jail on murder charges and is awaiting a trial because someone she rents her farm to accidentally, this was what happens when you have a farm, accidentally dug up three bodies in, in the yard. And he was like, oh, human remains. What happened here? There's an investigation. She is suspected, as the owner of the land, of having killed these three um, people, uh, two of whom are black, uh, and is put up on murder charges, and she dies in jail before her trial. And many people at the time suspected uh, that she committed suicide to avoid uh, a capital crime, to avoid the hangmen. Uh, other people, I think the more sensible people, have to, uh, think that she was just old and she died, uh, but suicide is a better story. Uh, so I was on the quest to find out who the hell Patty Cannon was, and it turns out the circumstances of her death, whether she was a suicide or not, is arguably the least interesting aspect of Patty Cannon's horrendous uh, life. She was, and this was not clear from my presentation today, a major player in this kidnapping crew. And it's significant, by the way, to find a, uh, a, fe uh, a, a woman so involved in this sort of business. Uh, it turns out she was a major player in this gang, the Cannon-Johnson gang. She takes over the gang's operations when her husband, Jesse Cannon, actually dies. Um, uh, it's her house that Cornelius ends up in in 1825. Her husband has died by then. Um, and uh, I got interested in her business dealings, in kidnapping and the domestic slave trade. I was aware of Solomon Northup's famous memoir, um, but this was 2011 when this email crossed my desk, and the Brad Pitt movie uh, with Michael Fassbender and uh, Lupita Nyong'o and everyone else had not come out uh, yet. And as you probably know, um, that brought huge attention, I think, to the, um, to the fact that there was a domestic slave trade that involved sucking in free people through kidnapping. Uh, and so the confluence of learning about the Cannon-Johnson gang then uh, with the spotlight brought by 12 Years a Slave suggested to me that maybe there was an opportunity uh, to tell a uh, small human story about one aspect uh, of this uh, trade, a story that hadn't been heard uh, before by the, perhaps by the general public who knew 12 Years a Slave, but perhaps not much else. That makes sense? You guys are just trolling me at this point. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Frankie. So I just have a quick question. You said that you often went days without finding sources of uh, significant material. Cool. And then uh, did you ever get like discouraged and feel like shelving the project? There are lots of historians in the room. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is a question for everyone, I think. Uh, I think this is the nature of historical research. It's very hard to think of uh, projects that are worth doing that are so tidily packaged and bound up with a ribbon and handed to you and say, hey, this is worth your time for the next six years. Just unwrap the box. All the sources you need are inside. That's not how history works. And even though we now live in this era where more and more primary sources, even from my period back in the 1820s, are digitized, still 99% of things I would want to look at are not digitized. You have to go somewhere. You have to see if it's been properly cataloged. You have to wade through folders which have not been indexed or perhaps even read by people for a very long time. This is the nature of the beast. It was the nature of the beast for my book about suicide. I'm sure uh, Sharon and Pat and all the other historians in the room went through very similar experiences uh, when they were doing it. Um, so I wasn't, it wasn't unexpected. Uh, to have that sort of experience. Though certainly I knew when I took on a case um, that lots of people in my field knew about, which is the five boys disappearing, but no one had ever written a book about before, that there's a reason 
why no one else has written a book about it before. There have been two scholarly articles about it, about 25 pages uh, each, and they use the two major sources I described, the body of letters to and from the mayor and the coverage in the one anti-slavery newspaper. And that's enough to write an article, two good articles, in fact, about 20 years apart. But it is not enough to write a, I don't know, 300-page uh, book. So you have to commit to be in this um, uh, for the long uh, haul. And I thought in this particular case um, that these, I'm going to call them characters, which makes them sound not real, like they're not flesh and blood, but that these characters could withstand this sort of attention and this sort of treatment. I thought Cornelius deserved this attention um, because he's gone without it for a long time. Yeah, thanks for the great question. Yeah, you mentioned it a little bit at the end. Of course, when we speak about this, we always speak about slavery. And what we often don't, for some reason, is speak about the, the level of uh, moral outrage which is required for a civil war. So in what way um, was you sort of hinted at it. Can you say a little bit more how these stories were used by the abolitionist movements to uh, you know, to stoke those flames of of of, of anti-slavery uh, feelings in yeah. the north. So uh, thank you for the great question. Uh, so most people in this room have heard of Uncle Tom's Cabin, right? I hope not everyone has read it. It's really. <laughs> Is it worth your time? I don't know. I have mixed feelings. I teach Uncle Tom's Cabin all the time, and I still have mixed feelings about whether I should keep assigning it uh, to people. It's very long, by the way. Uncle Tom's Cabin is a novel published by Harriet Beecher Stowe in the early 1850s. Uh, and according to some estimates, it was the most popular book of the 19th century, except for the Bible. Um, and it tells the story. It tells two intertwined stories. Uh, one is the story uh, of Uncle Tom, uh, who is an enslaved person on a plantation who gets mistreated and, and eventually uh, dies. And the other story is of a runaway slave and her family, her name is Eliza, uh, trying to make it to freedom from the, from the south into the, into the north. Uh, so this is made up, though it's based on true things. Um, and when, and again, I'm going to Someone said an apocryphal quote from Mark Twain earlier on. Here's my apocryphal quote from Abraham Lincoln. When Abraham Lincoln supposedly met Harriet uh, Beecher Stowe in, I think, 1862, he turned to her and he said, oh, you're the little lady who started this great war. And what he meant by that was that people reacted to Uncle Tom's cabin in a visceral uh, way. Southerners hated the book because um, it seemed to humanize enslaved uh, African Americans, uh, and it seemed to detail the pernicious evils of slavery and how slavery corrupted and poisons and ruins everything, including white families who are slave owners, how it makes them terrible people. Southerners hated that portrayal, obviously. Uh, Northerners, by many accounts, embraced the lessons of uh, Uncle Tom's uh, uh, cabin because it gave them a way to connect to enslave black people suffering as individuals in a way they hadn't been able to do um, before. So Uncle Tom's Cabin is the sort of ur text, the sort of stereotypical uh, example of an anti-slavery piece of writing designed to push the anti-slavery cause forward by getting northern white people to give a shit about black people connected to slavery. And what I'm arguing uh, is that um, uh, subsequent stories about uh, African Americans and about slavery and slave trading, uh, written by anti-slavery activists who grew up learning about what happened to Cornelius and Sam through the newspapers, uh, those stories start to show distinctive motifs. Uh, they start to focus not on the scale of slavery, uh, but on individual human stories within the slave experience or the slave trading experience. And they focus particularly on the separation of families, uh, particularly mothers from their uh, children, but in general you get the idea. And uh, I would argue that newspaper coverage of this particular case is the first time in American history where you can see sustained efforts by anti-slavery writers to indulge in that... Um, meaning making and that use of uh, motifs. And then you start to see more and more people do it, more and more people do it, more and more people do it, and then Harriet Beecher Stowe does it, and then the Civil War comes. Um, so I'm being sort of facile 
um, about that. But I do believe the separation of black families, the suffering of children, uh, is a demonstrably dominant motif in anti-slavery writing by the 1840s and 50s. And if you're looking for a lineage, there are probably multiple lineages, but if you're looking for a lineage, you can find one origin point in the coverage in print culture of this uh, story. So the lesson is, don't read Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, yes, um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, in your answer to that question, you just mentioned that um, journalists appealed to you know, particular, particularly compelling stories, not so much scale. My question is about scale, and my question is this. Your claim at the very beginning that there were as many persons on the reverse railroad as mm -hmm. on the railroad to the north, do you, th do you anticipate, what, do you think that's going to prove to be controversial in your field? Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate challenge? And do you have enough evidence to, do you think you have the evidence at hand to respond to those challenges? Thank you for bringing that up. That's a really uh, great question. Uh, uh, question. So I, just to recap, I did make the claim uh, that and there were qualifiers here. If you may have heard the qualifiers, I said things like roughly and perhaps, but I made the claim. <laughs> but I made the claim that uh, the size and scale of the Underground Railroad, freedom seekers leaving the South trying to get to the North, um, was comparable in size and scale and magnitude uh, to the scale of what I've called today the reverse underground or the kidnapping of free black people into slavery over the same time period and in the same rough geography, the continental uh, northeastern, uh, eastern United States, excuse me. Um, uh, let me ask everyone a question. I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but anyone, please take a crack at this. Um, how do historians know how many people gained their freedom through the Underground Railroad, the famous one, the Harriet Tubman one. How do historians know? How do they quantify that? Please, someone take a stab at that for me. Census data. What do you mean by census data? They actually would count. You could, there's actually records of, you know, you can look at them and you can see. And I think even at some point they even had them qualified as is this person mulatto and things like that. I mean, the, the things they would delineate in the census I means crazy. So uh, in the decennial, every 10 years, uh, federal census in different states, different towns within those states, can we see uh, rises or falls in the size of the slave population in a southern county or in the free black population in a northern county? And can we attribute those swings to the Underground Railroad? That would be the rationale? Okay. Uh, other ideas of how historians can know uh, how big the Underground Railroad was? Any faculty want to take a crack? Yes, sir. Right. Right. Do, uh, just to put you on the spot, I'm sorry to do this. Do you think uh, abolitionists, if that was true, uh, published uh, accurate, quantifiable information or stories? Stories sounds like one person, here's, his, here's their account. Uh, they, they seem to be persons of integrity and honesty. <laughs> <laughs> of course, maybe, yeah, everybody likes to inflate their numbers. <laughs> okay, so uh, yes, there is, there is some of that, of course, right? We know about some um, journeys along the Underground Railroad because they were subsequently uh, publicized. There are some anti-slavery activists who offer um, uh, numerical claims about how many people have uh, been on that route last year or the year before or over the past um, 10 years. As you can probably tell from me asking you this question, uh, I am not convinced that we have a robust set of sources to accurately quantify how many freedom seekers successfully exited slavery by something we are clearly defining to be the Underground Railroad, which is a very nebulous, actually, uh, loose uh, network, uh, by the way. So, uh, if we don't know exactly how many people ran, a ran away through the Underground Railroad, um, then uh, pinning me down on how many people were taken into slavery, but on the reverse Underground Railroad, seems like a fool's errand, uh, a, li a little bit. Um, which is to say, of course, it is very hard to quantify how many people were kidnapped into slavery, I've also just argued it's very hard to quantify how many people exited slavery through the Underground uh, Railroad. Uh, my sources are also full of anecdote and story and newspaper accounts. This boy vanished, I think he's in Georgia, uh, would be a typical 
parents' notice, right? Cornelius Sinclair's missing persons notice, right? Uh, is that evidence of one? Um, can we count that if, we, if, we, if, you, if I work on this for six years? How many people are there in my database if I went through and counted who seem to disappear and who seem to end up in slavery? Uh, what I've done suggests to me that yes, the scale is in the tens of thousands when measured over 60 years, and that's gonna be several hundred in a place like Philadelphia uh, in a single um, a year, perhaps. And I think that is broadly comparable, uh, but if anyone tries to pin me down on the exact numbers, I'm gonna wiggle like hell. Uh, thank you for the question. So I have two questions, kind of, but so um, in your opinion, I don't know if this is easy to answer, but you sort of talk about Canon and Joseph, and they seem like sort of thugs, the way you characterize them. So do you think that's sort of the end of the spectrum of how sophisticated this is, or if it's merely sh scratching the surface of what type of networks actually could have gone on? And sort of the second follow-up is that is, do you have any indication of how far into reconstruction this could have possibly gone? Yeah. Uh, on, the, on the second question, um, Kidnapping and human trafficking are with us in 2018. They've been with us uh, ever since. It take, takes different forms uh, today. The racial component is moder moderated and mediated and has transformed. And that process of transformation certainly began during and after the Civil War. Um, so I don't think kidnapping disappears. It takes on new forms um, and for different purposes, ab absolutely. Uh, the first question was yeah, about the characterization of the kidnappers. Yes, I'm happy to embrace the idea that uh, if, thug, if thug to you is someone that uses violence, then yes. Uh, Jesse Cannon and Joseph Johnson uh, are, um, are, are thugs, um, but I would also suggest to you they're remarkably sophisticated operators who evade the law, and kidnapping is illegal in every state that I've mentioned today. They evade the law for a long time. Uh, they grow their business. They, they, they are, they, what do they call them? What does what uh, President Bush like to call them? Job, no, Mitt, Mitt Romney, job creators? Uh, something like that. Uh, they're up from their bootstraps guys. Uh, they're like Ben Franklin if you've taken a different path. Um, they start their own business. It's a family business. It's a family business that grows and thrives over 15, 20 um, years. I can track um, Jesse Cannon back to 1812 when he starts kicking it. No, 1808 when he starts kicking this off. And he's in, uh, their family's in business for more than 20 uh, years. I think you need more than thug-like skills to succeed in business, uh, particularly when that business is uh, legal. I think they're highly skilled criminal operators. They're very good at using force for strategic uh, purposes, to buy the silence of their neighbors, to intimidate law enforcement, to terrorize captives uh, into keeping quiet when they're in the belly of a ship moored just 50 feet offshore in Philadelphia. Other gangs were intercepted by Philadelphia law enforcement when someone on a passing ship heard screams from the hold of another passing ship. No one screams on Cornelius' ship, and that's because folks like Jesse Cannon and Joseph Johnson are there sometimes literally with knives at their throats saying, if you say a word, I will cut your throat. So the use of violence is for them always uh, strategic. It's a tool of doing business. It's a tool of preserving their own liberty and lining their own um, pockets. So they're multifaceted. Uh, I'm not sure I'm interested in humanizing these characters in this particular uh, book, but they are interesting and sophisticated characters. Uh, nevertheless, thanks for that. That was great. I'm going to, oh, sorry. I see. Oh, you have, I'm over here. I'll st start here and then move over. I'm just wondering about the law enforcement itself. Mm -hmm the inner network that went on underneath? Because I don't think they were all afraid. I'm sorry, the, the work itself. You, I just didn't hear you. Try again. Oh, it must have been on. Okay, I just want to know, like, the law enforcement. It seems to me that there was, there was connections between them and the law enforcement, too. I don't think it was just those two guys that had all that power. It's like what went on underneath. And I think they were connected to the law enforcement as well. And the they is the gang in the sentence? Yes. yes. And I think they were all interconnected. And so, you know, they have all these young children. Lots of people are getting them in there. They're not just there by themselves. I just think there was a whole network of people. And I think the law enforcement was part of it. Yes. So I'd like to know if you have evidence of that. Yes, I do have evidence. Law enforcement cuts both ways in this story. Uh, we can find uh, constables, um, 
Uh, the mayor of Philadelphia is also effectively the chief of police in Philadelphia. Uh, some of his uh, agents and operatives um, do the right thing repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly in this story. Uh, but for every person in law enforcement that does the right thing over and over again, we can find just as many members of law enforcement, not just in urban centers like Philadelphia and Baltimore, but out on the eastern shore of Maryland and in Delaware, uh, who seem open to bribery, uh, who turn the other cheek, who seem to give tip-offs about raids before the raids uh, happen, or in some extreme cases, use their position in law enforcement to, let's put it in quotation marks, to arrest people of interest and then hand them over to kidnapping gangs. So the law enforcement constable becomes the frontline operator by proxy for these uh, gangs. And when this gang, when this particular gang, the Cannon Johnson gang, passes from the scene in 1829, uh, other gangs rush to fill its place, to take its market share, for lack of a better uh, phrase. And one of the um, operators who um, uh, comes to prominence in Philadelphia is a guy named George Alberti, um, who's uh, active for another 20 years. Uh, he's a constable. He's a former constable of the Philadelphia police, in quotation marks, uh, who uses that those privileges and those ac that, that access um, to effectively kidnap street kids and spirit them out of the city. And we know of all sorts of corrupt judges, justice of the peace, and magistrates uh, who will um, uh, lend themselves to this business in a slightly different way. Um, most of what I've been talking about so far has been direct capture of people that were free and taking them out of state. But as uh, Sharon and Pat and other people in the room are very well aware, uh, if you could prove to a magistrate or justice of the peace or judge that the black person you had in front of you was a runaway slave, from let's say Georgia or South Carolina, who'd somehow made it to Philadelphia and been living his, his life, if you can prove the black person you've got in a headlock in front of the judge is a runaway slave, then you can legally walk that person out of Pennsylvania, right? And what if you and that judge have a deal? What if you've been paying that judge for the last six years. We know dozens and dozens of cases where this has uh, happened. Um, and to uh, choose an extreme example of that, one of the uh, tenets of the 1850 um, Fugitive Slave Law is it sets up federal tribunals in northern cities like Philadelphia uh, where judges are paid to determine daily whether a black person hauled into court is really a runaway slave or a free person who's been kidnapped. And the, runaway, and the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 says, the people on this panel of judges uh, in these northern cities will be paid uh, $5 if they determine uh, the person was legally free and uh, shouldn't be in court in the first place. And they'll be paid $10 if they determine this person is a runaway slave. Uh, so we see uh, slaveholders in Congress putting their thumb on the scale uh, in that question of who's legally free, who's a runaway slave, etc., cetera, uh, et cetera. Uh, So kidnapping takes new forms, semi-pseudo-legal forms throughout this period, and that accelerates and intensifies after 1850, which is one of the things that Northerners hate so much about the fugitive slave law of 1850 and the compromise of 1850, one of the things that spurs, stirs uh, more serious discussion about outright war. Yeah, uh would you say, uh, I guess, the expertise of uh, Cannon and Johnson sort of like typified um, what was going on in this reverse Underground Railroad? Or would you say that there's possibly hundreds of Cannons and Johnsons that were running around and sort of like initiating this kind of like strategy and violence in the reverse railroad? Thank you for the question. Yes, if I was being facetious, I would say that... Um, you know, they are, what's a fancy car? The, the Teslas, uh, or they are the Steve Jobs of uh, um, uh, kidnapping street kids. They are good at what they do. They are um, highly skilled and, and meticulous, and that's why they stay in business uh, so long and evade the law for so long. There are plenty of um, small, small scale and small time operators who don't survive as long in this business because they do get uh, arrested or they get caught or they get beaten half to death by someone's parents who catch them stealing their kids. Uh, and we have all sorts of, this is actually a good note to end on perhaps, we have all sorts of evidence of the lengths to which black families, black parents and members of the black community in cities like Philadelphia will go to try to stop this and to deter uh, kidnappers. Uh, they organize into neighborhood watch groups to try and stop this. Um, there's one group which has both white and black members, founded in the 1850s in Boston called the Anti 
man-hunting league, and they are basically a black and white paramilitary organization who train every week on how to stop and kick the shit out of any kidnappers they find stalking in their streets. They practice what maneuvers they're gonna do, right? It takes 12 of them in a circle. They're gonna hold this dude by his arms or something like that. They've got plans for this. Um, so many of these efforts are uh, effective, not always effective, or I wouldn't have a story to tell clearly here today. Uh, but the number of kidnappers who are scared off by responses by black neighbors or by the black individuals who are um, um, their would-be victims who don't go quietly, who scream and yell bloody murder. It's like yelling, you know, rape or fire now, right? They yell kidnapper, kidnapper, and people come running. Um, who bite and tear at the flesh of kidnappers. If you lined up 100 kidnappers, uh, 80 of them would be covered in bite marks. Um, from the resistant, the physical resistance they've got from free black people who, of course, want to do everything in their power to prevent this um, uh, happening uh, to them. So I would say, say that um, those are real and important checks on the uh, uh, ultimate size and scope of the reverse underground road, the pushback, the retaliation, the defense, the resistance mounted uh, by individuals, by their parents, and by members of the free black community is something to behold. And that also terrifies southern, southern slaveholders as well. Thanks for the question. So thank you for, so much for uh, your questions and for your presentation. Um, once more, uh, there's a reception in the great room, so please join us there. And join me in thanking Dr. Bell. Thank you.